In this first segment, we go back to 1969. We do this every summer. A man uh, first walking on the moon. That man specifically was Neil Armstrong. And Rodney Rockwell, who is our station engineer, is here with us this morning. Rodney, thanks for coming in. Good morning, Rob. First time someone sets foot on the moon. I'm six years old at that time. Jason, you're not born. Matt, you're not born. Rodney, you're how old? Nine. You're nine. I had, had just turned nine. All right. So I don't, at the age of six, have full comprehension of just how big of a deal this is. Do you at the age of nine? No. Uh, I remember uh, getting ready to sit down and watch television with my uh, parents on, uh, on that Sunday night. And uh, I was very disturbed when they canceled Hee Haw. (laughs) (laughs) Who wouldn't be? That evening. Yes, I was very, very much looking forward to watching Hee Haw. And uh, they they canceled that uh, to bring us coverage of the moon landing and the the moonwalk. And uh, I I was trying to piece it all together in my mind. But it... uh, it definitely sparked an interest, which uh, continues uh, to this day. Now, this all stemmed from President Kennedy in the early 60s, making it the stated goal to land a man on the moon by the end of the decade. Yes. Uh, in, uh, I guess it was May of 1961, uh, Alan Shepard had just completed a 15-minute suborbital flight. So we had about 15 minutes of space flight experience, and John F. Kennedy drops a bomb before a joint session of Congress and says, we're going to the moon. And the uh, personnel at NASA were very much uh, caught off guard by this. Uh, they, they had no idea how to do it. Uh, they knew that they were going to have to invent new technologies. Uh, they knew that uh, new types of metals were going to have to be developed, uh, new procedures that they had never even thought of before. I mean, nobody ever uh, conceived what a free return trajectory even was. So they had to come up with all this stuff before the end of the decade. And in the meantime, the Russians were beating us at every turn. And uh, to put it in perspective, in 1969, when they landed a man on the moon, they were using technology that had less processing power than this iPhone that I hold in my hand. Yes, it was a very, uh, very primitive computer. Um, it, uh, it, it did have uh, very limited memory and, and so forth, but it, it was a very uh, specific piece of hardware that was designed to do what it did. Um, and the, uh, the astronauts were very well trained in how to use it. Uh, it operated on a, on a noun and verb type of a configuration, and they had a list of numbers that represented the various commands, noun, verb, and so forth, so they could make an entry into it, which would command the uh, spacecraft to do certain things. I've been to uh, Cape Kennedy in Florida, uh, I guess previously known as Cape Canaveral, and you can see the rocket that they used uh, to send a man to the moon, and you can you can take a look inside, get an idea of uh, master control and, and what things look like, and it's pr- quite primitive by today's standards. By today's standards, yes, but there's still a lot of technology that carries over, particularly when it comes to the propulsion side of it uh, in terms of, of launching it into space. Uh, it was a three-stage or a three-section rocket that was uh, 363 feet tall, and uh, it developed uh, over seven and a half million pounds of thrust, uh, which is the amount that it could lift. The rocket itself weighed about six and a half million pounds at launch. The first stage engine um, developed over uh, 2,000, or, or, I'm sorry, excuse me, it, it developed over a million and a half pounds of thrust. They had five of them that were strapped together. Each of those rocket engines consumed over 2,000 pounds of fuel and oxidizer per second. So you could literally empty a swimming pool in a matter of, of a part of a minute with what those uh, engines were consuming. Let's talk about, and we, each year we've done this, we've kind of explored a different part of this, but let's talk about the people selected to be a part of this moon mission and what they, uh, what they were qualified as and uh, how they wound up doing what they did. Well, at that time, each of the astronauts that were selected by NASA were, were proven test pilots. Um, many of them had been uh, war veterans, uh, in some cases going back as far as World War I. Many were Korean War veterans, uh, aces and so forth. Um, and when the opportunity came up to uh, apply for astronaut training, many of them decided to go for it. A lot of them were rejected. Most of the uh, applicants were rejected, but uh, they, they picked uh, anywhere from 7 to 12 or so at a time, each of the rounds that they had. But each, uh, each man was very qualified to fly high-performance jet aircraft, and in the case of Neil Armstrong, he also flew the experimental X-15 
uh, aircraft on uh, up to the uh, edges of space. And there's an interesting story that goes along with him almost not making it to the moon mission. Yeah, prior to the uh, Apollo 11 landing, the uh, the astronauts had what was called an LLTV, Lunar Landing Training Vehicle, that they used, which represented the flight of the lunar module. It basically had a rocket engine underneath of it. It had uh, thrusters that they could control the attitude of the trainer, and it uh, it lifted off the ground much like a helicopter did. And they got up to an altitude of several hundred feet. At that point, they would put it into landing mode where they would simulate a lunar landing. Armstrong was training one day, and he lost control of it. They had a, uh, a thruster that was on board the, uh, the trainer, was inadvertently turned on or came on by itself. But anyway, as a result, it rocked almost 90 degrees off axis. At that point, Armstrong tried to regain control of it, and in the whole process, the, the whole uh, uh, the whole spacecraft or the whole training ve vehicle was falling to the ground, as you would expect. He literally only had a second or two to react, and he hit the ejection button and was blown out of the trainer. And uh, at about 100 feet, his parachute deployed, and he, he was almost killed. The trainer hit the ground and immediately exploded, so he definitely would have died. Quite a story. The most famous man in space almost didn't make it there. Well, at, at the time, we really didn't know too much about the man. All, all we knew was he was selected to be the first man to walk on the moon. But beyond that, we didn't know a whole lot. Tell me about the situation in landing the rocket on the moon. Well, the lunar module uh, was designed to hold two people. And in this case, it had uh, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong, with Neil Armstrong being the commander. Uh, Buzz Aldrin was the, quote, lunar module pilot, although he was not active in flying it and landing it on the moon. Um, they started out uh, it, uh, docked to the command module with Michael Collins as they were orbiting the moon. They separated from the command module and made their way to the lunar surface. As they're trying to find a landing spot, the, the computer is coming up with all kinds of overloads and errors and so forth, and normally that would seem to be a very serious situation. However, the ground controllers at NASA analyzed the messages they were getting, and they were basically uh, alarms that were telling the computer that it was getting too much data, and it was uh, going into what was called an executive overflow situation. And so what the computer did, and it was programmed to do this, it, it basically ignored any of the jobs that were lesser priority than what they had to handle at the time. So they basically disregarded this. Um, and as they approached the lunar surface, Armstrong's looking out the window, uh, and he realizes that what he had anticipated to be a very smooth surface is strewn with uh, boulders, craters, and all kinds of other obstructions. So he had to fly over that which resulted in them landing approximately four miles beyond their intended landing spot. Um, it also ate up a lot of fuel. So as the lunar module is coming down to make the landing, they're getting calls from the ground uh, from Houston Control saying, you've got 60 seconds. And uh, <clears throat> at this time, Armstrong is struggling to find a decent spot to land. Then comes the call out, 30 seconds. So at that point, he knew he had 30 seconds of fuel remaining. About 10 seconds later, he found, finally found a spot, and he safely landed. With 20 seconds of fuel to spare. Uh, I think the actual uh, number was around 17 or 18 seconds. Mm -hmm. So, But for a test pilot, that's a long time. <laughs> Jason. Rodney, it's always good to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. Good so to see you, uh, too. Absolutely, yeah. How did Michael Collins draw the short straw? He was the, he was the one of the three that didn't get to walk on the moon. Well, what they had was, I guess they had a seniority uh, system. And uh, Michael Collins was selected to be the command, uh, command module pilot, while Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were selected to, to land on the moon. All the missions had to go through a selection process like that. Um, Collins' uh, purpose in the mission was just as important as Armstrong and Aldrin because he's the one who had to retrieve Armstrong and Aldrin when they were blasting off the moon to come back. He had to be the one to find them and to make the link up and to be able to transfer them from the lunar module to the command service module for the trip back to Earth. So if, if, if he somehow failed in his mission, Armstrong and Aldrin never would have made it back. But we would have known who he was at that point because most of us uh, obviously were very familiar with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, but uh, I think most of us probably never heard the name Michael Collins. So 
um, you know, he did his job, and, and for that, he's probably uh, far less recognized. Had he had he not done his job correctly, everybody would know who Michael Collins was. Very, yeah, very much so. But uh, Michael Collins, after Armstrong and Aldrin departed to land on the moon, Michael Collins continued to orbit the moon, which the orbit around the moon takes approximately two hours. So for, for one hour of each orbit, uh, Collins was on the backside of the moon and was out of commu- communication range with the Earth. So he was literally the loneliest man in the universe. Yeah, imagine how scary that would be, wow. especially by yourself. He, uh, he later recalled that he was never lonely or had any concerns like that because they kept him so busy with doing other experiments and other tasks. And after Armstrong and Aldrin had landed on the moon, one of his primary jobs was to find them. They, they, they had a telescope aboard, and he was supposed to find them, I guess, to help in the rendezvous process. But uh, because they landed long, he was not able to see where they had landed. So they had a specific target that they were supposed to land at on the moon. Right. Uh, yet they didn't fully understand what the surface of the moon was like. Well, because at that time, we had used uh, unmanned uh, probes to look at the surface of the moon, uh, starting out with the uh, the Ranger project, which was uh, a program designed to literally crash land into the moon. And as the probe was uh, descending towards the surface at a high rate of speed, it was utilizing high-speed photography to take literally thousands and thousands of pictures per minute. And so what they did is they selected areas where they thought somewhere down the road, two, three, four years down the road, that they might consider landing uh, a human spacecraft so that's where these ranger probes went to we also had the lunar orbiter program which was just just as it implies it was a an orbital series of missions with unmanned probes to photograph the moon but these were orbiting from about 60 miles up so they weren't getting a lot of detail you mentioned that there were the all the alarms that were going off was was there ever any um, serious risk or, or uh, potential catastrophe for this and, and how confident was NASA you know, before uh, Apollo 11 takes off, that that this was going to be successful, not only in terms of landing on the moon, but but returning safely? Well, I don't believe anybody at NASA ever gave any odds as to what they thought uh, the the chances were of a successful landing. Armstrong felt that it was 50-50. He he felt that it was about a 50-50 chance of making it and not making it. like uh, like we had said, they, they selected the, the landing area, and when they got close to it, the closer they got to it, the worse it looked. So they kind of had to improvise on the fly. Well, I think that's probably just things you do when you're you know the first person to do something. You just that's 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 how you have to operate. So. Well, exactly. And the subsequent mission, Apollo 12, they they actually targeted a specific area that uh, a, a space probe had landed in, in 1967, I believe. It was uh, Surveyor 3. was an unmanned U.S. probe that landed on the moon. It scooped up lunar samples. It uh, d- made a lot of photographs, and it also shot some video. Um, the target landing site for Apollo 12 was the Surveyor 3 landing area. Apollo 12 landed within 600 yards of Surveyor 3 in, in uh, November of 1969. Matt Harvey. Good morning, Rodney. Um, I, I, I kind of want to go back to when you're nine years old and, and talk about and hear your experience about how, what it meant to you to observe this real time and the community or the national sentiment that this created. Well, um, like I said, I was nine years old, and I was aware that we were going to the moon, but I just really – it just didn't really register with me what the significance significance of that was. Uh, but as the program developed, I, I developed a very keen interest in space flight and engineering and electronics. Uh, so that, that experience early on uh, kind of propelled me to where I am today. Is that a pun, propelled? Uh, well, something, yes. <laughs> well, it, it, or, or propulsed. I mean, here, here it is. 50 plus years later and this is just ingrained into the ethos of america well it was a it was definitely a big deal uh i forget how many millions and millions of people watched the moonwalk it was uh, one of the most highly watched event in the history of the world uh at the time it was seen in over 80 countries around the world uh people were glued to their televisions wherever they were to uh, to watch this and uh the 
the consensus of, of the people around the world was this wasn't necessarily a United States accomplishment, but this was an accomplishment of mankind. And the Arms, the Armstrong and Aldrin pretty much felt the same way. And, and it felt good to kick the Russians well, yeah, that's what it was all about. It was all about beating the Russians to the moon uh, because Kennedy had set the, the goal back in 1961. And uh, in 1961, at that point, the Russians were ahead of us in every way. But uh, it wasn't until the mid, uh, about the mid-1960s was when the United States had finally caught up and, and surpassed the Russians in accomplishments in outer space. According to NASA.gov, Rodney, uh, an estimated 650 million people worldwide watched Neil Armstrong's walk on the moon. It is, to this date, still the single most watched event in television history. Well, that's not surprising considering uh, what, was, uh, what was going on at the time. Um, unfortunately, the interest quickly waned as we continued the Apollo program. Uh, Apollo 12 come along, and uh, very few people were interested in that. Uh, and then Apollo 13 came down in uh, April of 1970, and they had the explosion aboard the, uh, the service module, which uh, c immediately canceled the moon landing, but it also uh, put the astronauts' lives at, at extreme danger, and it took a lot of effort to bring those guys back uh, alive. You know, that's a good point you make. I remember as a little kid, whenever there was a, a, a takeoff or a moon landing or whatever, and where they would return to Earth, it would be such a big television thing. Everybody would gather around the one small little black and white television in your house and watch it. And uh, they they uh, they did lose it. Uh, audience as it went along. People lost interest. It was okay. We're going to the moon again. So what? Like it was no big deal now. And that, what, what, what you know? What do something? <laughs> then land, grab rocks, and bring it home. That's that's exactly right. Apollo twelve didn't uh, garner near the attention that Apollo eleven did because you know obviously, hey, we've been there, we've done that. Um, hey, is, tell me about Buzz Aldrin's pen. Oh, okay. Um, as uh, as Armstrong and Aldrin are preparing to go out and walk on the moon, of course they've got they're putting their spacesuits on, along with their big heavy backpack and so forth, and inside the lunar module. Is, there's not a lot of room. I mean, it, it, was a, it was a craft that was designed only to fly in space, uh, so it could not fly in our atmosphere. It could not survive reentry. Uh, it was very, very tiny. It barely had room enough for two people in it. Now you've got these two guys that are putting on these very big, bulky spacesuits with these tremendous-sized backpacks, and they're maneuvering around. And uh, as they're moving around in there uh, to get to – get, uh, out of the lunar module, you actually have to get on your hands and knees. The hatch, which is close to the floor, has to be opened, and you have to come out of the spacecraft on your hands and knees backwards, and you can't see anything. So in the process of going through all that, um, Aldrin inadvertently bumped a circuit breaker switch, and he broke it off. And it probably was the most important circuit breaker that they needed to get off of the moon because it was the circuit breaker that they had to turn on to activate the engine that took them off of the surface of the moon. Um, now, Aldrin didn't realize it at the time, and it wasn't until hours later that the moonwalk was over and they're taking off their spacesuits and getting ready to settle down to go to sleep for the night that Aldrin looked down and realized we've got a problem. So they relayed that to the ground controllers at Houston to try to come up with a solution. Uh, in the meantime, Armstrong and Aldrin got four or five hours of sleep to prepare for the liftoff from the moon the next day. When the time came for the lunar liftoff, in order to arm the engine, Aldrin took the cap off of an ink pen and just stuck it down the hole and pushed whatever was left of the switch back down into its position, and it made the switch the launch occurred and they came back safely. <laughs> so that's a great the, it story. Was, uh, it was the it was literally the little uh, blue or black tip off of a big pen. Uh, back then, I think the pen might have been nineteen cents. Mm -hmm. So that that saved the day. If yeah, hey, uh, let's talk about the TV pictures from the moon as they were observed. Well, by today's standards, they were extremely crude. Uh, they were somewhat difficult to watch. There wasn't a, a whole lot of definition or anything. Uh, and the reason why was the video that came back from the moon was done in slow scan television. So you only had about maybe 10 frames per second of video, which was not compatible with the current technology of the time, which was NTSC, 
which uses uh, 30 frames per second. And NASA had not really given much thought to television, so in order for the networks to carry the video, they simply pointed a conventional camera at the video monitor at Houston, and then that was relayed to the networks, and that's what was broadcast to the rest of the world. The actual video that was seen by the ground tracking stations in Canberra, Australia, and other places around the world, the video was said to be extremely sharp and well-defined uh, in black and white. Uh, subsequent missions, they used uh, color cameras that uh, had a lot better definition. How confident were they about reentry on the way back uh, and, uh, and eventual retrievement of the astronauts in the water? Because they well, used to land in the ocean and then fish them out. Yeah, the, uh, the command module had been tested uh, with manned space flight several times before Apollo 11, uh, starting with Apollo 7. Um, and prior to that, they had uh, flown several unmanned Apollo missions out into space and simulated the, uh, the reentry speed coming back through the atmosphere, which was um, just a little under 25,000 miles an hour is how fast they reentered the Earth's atmosphere, which calculates out to about seven miles per second. And uh, just a couple of minutes left here, uh, Rodney. What do you find most fascinating about the, the Neil Armstrong moonwalk, the landing, and as we look back at it 54 years later today? Well, I just, uh, looking, as somebody who understands engineering and electronics and so forth, looking back and, and see that we did it with the technology we had at that time, I find uh, completely remarkable. Um, I'm not sure that we would, I'm not sure that we would take the risk today using that technology to do what we did in the 1960s. Um, and it was only because President Kennedy said, this is what we're going to do. What technologies have come from that era that uh, maybe the average person isn't aware of? Um, well, the Apollo guidance computer was the first computer to actually use uh, silicone technology uh, in, its, uh, in its microchips and its uh, transistors and so forth. Prior to that, they used a, a completely different type of technology, which was a lot bigger, used a lot more electricity, um, and was just not all that efficient. So microcomputers, that was, that was probably the beginning of the microcomputer era. Uh, it's said that the Apollo computers at the time on board the spacecraft had the equivalent computing power of, of, of a cell phone today or of later computers like the Apple II and, and that type of technology. Jason or Matt, any final questions for Rodney? Well, we all, you know, seen the picture of Neil Armstrong placing the flag uh, in the surface of the moon. Uh, what can you tell us about doing that, and is it still standing? Well, the um, the thought of taking a flag to the moon was was pretty much an afterthought. It was another one of those things that NASA never gave a lot of thought to. So, uh, prior to the mission, they sent uh, one of their secretaries down to Sears to buy a flag. And uh, they were able to come up with a, a way to mount it and a way to make it look like it was uh, waving on the moon. And what they did is they had a, uh, a rod that came off the top of the mast and extended uh, at a 90-degree angle in reference to the mast. And the top of the flag was attached to that, so it looked like it was, it was out in the breeze waving. Uh, and that was all literally thrown together at the last minute. And that NASA never acknowledged where they got the flag from because they did not want another episode of Tang. And you probably don't know what Tang is, but Tang was a oh, powdered, yeah. a powdered yep. drink uh, that was available back then. Uh, it was an orange drink. And so that went to the moon, and they mixed it with water, and that's what they drank. And when, uh, when Tang realized that they were taking that along, they put the commercials out on television. So NASA did not want another one of those episodes, so they didn't <laughs> announce where the, the flag came from. But uh, planning of the flag was quite difficult. Uh, they expected a lot more dust and dirt in the lunar surface. It was only a few inches, and they got down to rock. The flag barely held up and they were very careful not to bump it as they continued their moonwalk because they didn't want to knock it over and as the uh the ascent engine of the lunar module lifted off the moon uh, buzz aldrin looked out the window and just at the last second he saw the flag fall over oh no so it's it's laying on the lunar surface today when they went back to the moon subsequently were they anywhere near the same location i think the nearest landing site to apollo 11 was probably Apollo 17, and they would have landed within, I'm going to say, three or 400 miles. So not that close. Not, not that close, no. The, uh, Apollo 11 was, was 
basically to see if we could do it. After that, they decided to get into the scientific aspect of it, and they picked landing sites that would yield the most scientific data. Um, the last moon flight occurred December of 1972, and it's the only flight in which a geologist was on board, and that was uh, Harrison Jack Schmidt. Uh, and it was very beneficial to have a geologist because he was able to spot things that the average astronaut who had gone through a lot of geological training wasn't able to pick out. Is the flag intact? Uh, the flag is intact. It's just laying over. Now, the flag is not. The flag is now uh, speculated to be white. Uh, all of the colors would have washed out by now because of the intense solar radiation uh, on the moon, as would be the case with the five other flags that were left there. Um, the five other flags continue to, to fly, uh, if you will, because uh, not that long ago they, they sent uh, a probe around the moon, which is still there, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And there were times when the LRO got to within just uh, a few dozen miles of the lunar surface as it flew over, and it flew over these landing sites and photographed it. So in these photographs, you can see a tiny little shadow where the sun is shining in a particular direction, and you can actually see the outline of the flag in the lunar surface. So it's the flags are still standing at the five other landing sites. You can imagine if uh, some civilization years from now lands there and they wonder why everybody on that planet surrendered. <laughs> a white flag. A bunch of white flags everywhere. Rodney, good to see you, man. Thanks for coming in. Good to be seen.